Um, I want to begin with a beautiful shot of the Han River. We could have the slides, please. Um, the Han River, of course, has its miracles associated with it. One of the ones that I love here is this rainbow bridge, the Bampo Bridge in Korea, a place that I love to visit and that I think of as inspiring and important for us. Today I'm going to try to posit, very briefly, a new theory of social community, a way to explain to the individuals in the room and our friends vir virtually around the world through video the reasons why social networking is getting the traction that it's getting, the conditions that have to be set by great switched on organizations and governments like those that you find in South Korea, and the ways in which individuals all around the world can do serious, important work off of those infrastructure pieces rather than just things that are playful and, and uh, trivial. Let's begin with some cliches, though, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look at the most popular foods in the world. These have grown up from all around the world to become enormously successful and hugely popular, and they are contributing to most of us becoming fat, but somewhat happy in the things that we eat, okay? All of these things have succeeded for a variety of reasons, some of them physiognomic. They appeal to our taste buds, the number of receptors and the types of receptors we have on our tongue in just the right way. They appeal, they appeal to our brains and the neural pleasure centers in just the right way. And in most cases, they have economic conditions that favor their adoption and acceptance the world over. But whenever you look at the world's most popular foods, you can also see that there is always without exception, a frontier of quality, a frontier of excellence someplace in the world. If we just take the burger thing, the American sort of disease, on the East Coast, there's a world-class chef creating Shake Shack, a better burger. On the West Coast, many people are enormous fans, fanatics about In-N-Out Burger, right? Here in Chicago, where we are sitting today, Frontera Grill is leading the world. Rick Bayless, Deanne Bayless, his wife, are leading the world in the creation of authentic, amazing Mexican foods. Of course, kimchi is one of the things that the Koreans have given the entire world, and this is now an enormous phenomenon in different places, starting to emerge everywhere in the world, but this one in particular in LA is so popular that social networks are used every day to track the Koji trucks and to figure out where they are, this is exploding to a new level of global visibility lately as we see television shows emerging around it. Kimchi Chronicles has already debuted. Coming soon from PBS is Stop and Bop. These things are incredibly interesting ways for people to learn about Korean food and to celebrate its appeal as it makes its advance around the world culturally. Now I want to talk to you about the roots of what makes something hot like that. This is Stephen Jay Gould, the now deceased famous paleontologist that did brilliant essays each and every month in the Natural History magazine. One of the most important essays he ever wrote was 22 years ago, just next week. Next week it will have its 22nd anniversary. That essay, easily found on the internet, is called, called Counters and Cable Cars. It's been recognized around the world as one of the most seminal essays on the topic of authenticity. And when he wrote this brilliant article, Stephen Jay Gould was sitting at a lunch counter, a famous place to dine in San Francisco. He was noticing the way the waitress was responding to him and to everyone else. She immediately recognized that he was a newbie. He had never been there before. He watched as she was serving some eggs to a patron sitting down the counter from him a few steps, and she turned around and subtly blotted away all of the, uh, all of the butter that was on the eggs and the plate around the eggs. And he just sort of raised his eyes at her and she said, oh, he has high cholesterol, it's not good for him. Another patron paid and looked at her for a minute and said, ah, wasn't too bad, I might come back again someday. And she looked at Stephen Jay Gould and said, he's in here every day. Okay, so this was a woman who had what he called authenticity of experience. He was responding to each individual as an individual in a really interesting way. He then talked about how we feel different if we are standing in front of a dinosaur in a museum and it's real dinosaur bones instead of fiberglass replicas. Just a few blocks from here, you can stand in front of the world's largest Tyrannosaurus Rex 
Sue. Or you can go to O'Hare Airport and see a replica of Sue, the exact same size, every bone painstakingly modeled in fiberglass. And guess what? It feels different if you're standing in front of the real Sue. The third kind of authenticity that Stephen Jay Gould postulated was authenticity of place. If you're in San Francisco and you see the trolley cars actually functioning, it feels different than if the exact same trolley car is moved to Disneyland, where it no longer is rooted in a particular experience and place. He called that authenticity of place. Now, Stephen Jay Gould was a legitimate genius and one of my personal heroes. What's interesting is that Stephen Jay Gould could not have imagined 22 years ago the kinds of conditions that have been set in the world for our interaction and interdependence and activities with one another that is now routine and normal, especially in places like Seoul, where 10.3 million people are connected through a digital infrastructure that is basically man managed and planned by one enterprise, SKT. And that leads to a fourth new kind of authenticity. I'm calling it authenticity of group. Everywhere in the world, when you find an individual or a family member with a rare disease, what's new and amazing is the way spontaneously support sites have emerged to help those individuals and their family members and caregivers learn about that rare disease. If you or somebody that you know is unlucky enough to get cystic fibrosis, what you will discover is that there's going to be a dozen people on the internet somewhere who save your life, who make you feel like life is worth living each and every day. And you'll never meet them in person, perhaps, but these will be the most important people you know. This is authenticity of group. The idea that whether it's alcoholism you're trying to recover from, or some rare disease, or some special challenge you're trying to solve, the thing that matters to us most today is if we're deeply, richly, profoundly connected to people who share the same sort of purpose, goals, and conditions that we are trying to deal with. This is authenticity of group. At the tail end of my remarks, I'm going to give you six conditions that help you to know whether or not you've got those exact underlying principles working on behalf of whatever it is you're trying to create in a vital group. That'll come later. But understand that there are trivial groups, the people that we have thousands of friends with on Facebook, and vital groups where we are trying to do something important together, and we think of it as the single most important thing we pay attention to. I want to talk about that second kind in particular as we try to lay out some principles, news you can use, and ideas you can steal. Now, some of them are just for fun. And of course, in Korea, the lineage game has become the number two most profound sort of multi-user gaming system in the world. Only World of Warcraft is bigger, 54% of the share market, but 22%, 24% if you add both kinds of lineage, the first one and the second generation one, are using lineage on a day-to-day -day basis. As most of you know, this is such a profound social experience in many parts of Seoul that late at night, after the parlors where people go, often dressed in clan gear to play the game, are forcing them out onto the street. They continue their games and in physical space in a sort of playful way, often in costume, okay? So it's a very interesting way to sort of reform relationships. Let's look at another one, Cacao Talk. Big, hot um, sort of phenomenon as a capability in Korea is really what happens when you combine Twitter and chat and gift experiences and allow those things to be self-forming. Now, neither one of those things rises to the level of becoming so vital that they're central to the way you're living your life, but they are nevertheless important experiences. The best modern theorists now point out that if you want any kind of revolution to happen inside of, an, uh, of a country, you have to permit both prosaic and inspiring uses of the underlying technology. We have to do things that are ordinary, allow people to share goofy photographs of their cats. And we have to do things that are exceptional, allow people to create Twitter experiences that drive the social revolution that we see in the Arab Spring. Both of these things turn out to be crucial, interesting, and valuable. 
And I'm calling this, for today's purposes, inevitable serendipity. If you set the right conditions, amazing things will emerge. They will be important, game-changing, revolutionary, and valuable. And the things that you need to do are to set the kinds of conditions that we see happening in Seoul in particular, right? So it's got the second largest blogging community in the world. It's got twice the active rate of Twitter use as the United States and higher incidences of social networking than anywhere else in the world. The average sort of ethernet or, or internet user in Korea has two times the, um, the baud rate and the, and the speed of the average American. Korea should be extraordinarily proud of having built the most switched on networked infrastructure in the world. And that sets the conditions for the things that I'm going to talk about next. Here again, a trivial example. One of the hottest new social experiences in places like New York and LA is people on Turntable FM. What's happening here is that individuals will take over a room, a bunch of folks with avatars that look vaguely like South Park creatures, go into that room and somebody runs a bunch of songs and you vote that these songs are either lame or awesome. And that gives the room a net rating according to the shared experience that people are having. And this is an interesting example of a spontaneous innovation on top of social networking that's beginning to emerge. And what I'm trying to give us a sense of is that those kinds of things only emerge once the underlying conditions for social greatness have been established and articulated. Now in Korea, we also see some of the most interesting forms of accelerators and, and partnerships across different educational institutions and fantastic new ways to try to foster a deep understanding of innovation and commercialization of the resulting ventures. Okay? So those are what I would describe as necessary preconditions. But to everybody listening, in this room and in the virtual room that Ted provides us worldwide, I want to say that we have to go a little bit further. It's time now for us to consciously understand the things that foster true breakthroughs, okay? So if we learn from Korea and combine that with the best examples of things that have emerged to be socially important to people around the world, what we discover is that you know, the, the role of governments is to create the social scaffolding in effect, to make it possible for human beings to do the things they want to do, some trivial, some important, and to get out of their way. Just create lots of capabilities, allow the individuals to do what they need and want, build, as Korea has done, the research centers, the accelerators, and the ecosystem of venture capital for investment, expect and encourage serious and prosaic innovations to be what social scientists call emergent. They will just rise out of the nutrient bath as if they were just sort of developing. And the best of those will be self-organizing and self-optimizing. It has been my privilege over many years to try to counsel SK Telecom in doing this. For those of you that aren't aware of it, Korea enjoys the rarest of conditions, a largely monopolistic or leadership organization that instead of just trying to hoover your wallets, is specifically trying to figure out what is our responsibility to create the most switched on, engaged, and creative environments that our customers and, and, and citizens can engage in. But we all have a lot to learn in the academic sphere. Clay Shirky, the author of Here Comes Everybody First, has written a more recent book now called Cognitive Surplus. And what he's basically saying is, most of us are in the habit of using the internet four plus, and very often five, six, seven, eight, or nine hours a day, and what we're doing less of is watching conventional TV. He also points out that the resulting phenomenon is that this is a two-way contributing medium. In television, you're just passive. When you're using the internet, you're typing things, organizing things, putting things in folders, sharing things, emailing the things you like to the people that you like rating things. And it's the net result of that that he calls cognitive surplus, our ability to create something that's getting steadily better over time. And I'm going to suggest to you that the really interesting thing 
is that when you set those conditions particularly brilliantly, it makes possible the kind of amazing, serious, transformational, social, emergent movements that we're seeing all through the Arab Spring as individuals rise up and say, this is not the way I want to live anymore. We, the citizens, have a point of view and we will be heard. And that's so exciting. Wouldn't it be lovely to see that? And say, for instance, and I'm just making this up, North Korea. So the thing that's interesting is when you look at it in terms of underlying principles, how you get it to work, you have to ask yourself what makes a community of people that are truly interdependent and need each other. Now at TED3, 25 years ago, I gave away a half a million dollar theory from Doblin that was specifically designed to understand what was the nature of communities, communities that really work. We studied communities through history. We went through 14 file cabinets of things written about community, theories of community, models of community, principles of community. We did a meta theory of all those things and we discovered something that is astonishing and important for people to understand. It turns out that if you want to build a community, these are the six principles that matter. And it's a bit of a sandwich if you actually want to understand it. A community that's going to work is going to have a purpose. It's going to have a shared identity. It's going to be organic and rapidly evolving, and it will adapt and be resilient, especially if it's under threat. Those are characteristics of the group. But ladies and gentlemen, the thing that makes it weird, the thing that made it hard to understand and required an enormous team of social scientists to crack is that there are also two characteristics that are not characteristics of the group. They're characteristics of the individuals who choose to be part of that group. Think of that as the bread of the sandwich. No community is truly a community unless you're willing to and routinely do put some effort into it. No community is truly a community and maintains its community strength unless and until the individuals have freedom within it to do what they want to do, to leave when they want to leave, to bring their friends when they want to bring their friends. These six principles turn out to be a really big deal. We, most of us, when we create communities, assume it's going to be our friends, that they will do it out of affection, and they will do it for fun, and those are very brittle communities. The communities that matter, the communities I invite you to create, the communities I hope we all will participate in and, and occasionally found, are the communities that we depend on for our survival and for our ability to make a difference in the world. Those are the ones where we're putting in some effort and we have the freedom to evolve it as we see fit as individuals. But the four characteristics in the middle they are shared characteristics, and those have to be fostered wherever possible by the spirit of the infrastructure, the capabilities, and the collective group that's trying to do something amazing. I encourage you to join the communities that are a blast, that are just joyous and fun, because it's a lot better than watching TV. But I especially invite you to build the kind of communities that will change the world and make a difference. George Bernard Shaw, 78 years ago, said, God may have created this world, but that's no excuse for us not to make it better. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite your involvement as the young entrepreneurs, the young visionaries, the young individuals that just want to make the world a little better in some specific way. These principles can help you do it. And if you want the slides that I've used, you're welcome to them. You go to clientweb.doblin.com, log in as TEDx, and with the password Han River, and that will get you these notes. This is my personal email address. I answer all my emails personally. It's a privilege to be at TED for my fifth TED event. I really appreciate the chance to speak with you today. Mr. Larry Keeley.